100. I am Professor Curtis, your instructor for this course. This lecture will introduce us to the course that we're going to be having this term. So let's get started. This is a general survey class about physics. Physics is about the universe around us. So to get started, let me introduce you to myself, your instructor. I graduated from the University of Idaho and when I was an undergraduate, I double majored in metallurgical engineering and English. Yeah, I was kind of the oddball renaissance guy on campus. And then I stayed and for a graduate degree and got that in mechanical engineering. And along the way, I picked up another bachelor's degree in Spanish. And then I went out into the real world to make my mark. Started my engineering career as a materials engineer and I was working in areas of metallography and materials testing. So you can see an example of that here on your screen. This picture up here in the corner is basically a photomicrograph of a bolt. So you can see the bolt threads that are here in the picture. And the discoloration that you're seeing is a result of what's called an etchant. So what we've done is we've taken the bolt and we've sliced it down the middle from top to bottom then we take half of that bolt and stick it into a mount so we basically encase it in epoxy resin that's the kind of greenish blue plastic stuff that you see here and then we grind the surface of the metal down to a mirror finish so it's all polished and smooth and then we apply an etchant which is simply a chemical reagent and different combinations of chemicals will reveal different characteristics of the microstructure in the material. So here what you're looking at with the blue discoloration on the edge of your bolt threads is case hardening. And you want to harden the case of your bolts because there's a lot of friction on the surface of the bolt thread. As you loosen and tighten your nuts on your bolts, you get a lot of friction. So you want to put some wear resistance there on that surface. And the way we do that is by hardening it through a process called case hardening. Essentially, you stick it in an oven and let it bake. And the temperature that you bake it at, how long you keep it in there, and then what you do with it, how quickly do you cool the metal after you take it out of the oven? It's a whole process called heat treatment. And it's uh, very specialized for different materials and applications. So the particular uh, application we're looking at here is hardening your bolt thread. And so we make this photomicrograph so we can measure the depth of the case hardening on the edge of the bolt. And you want to do that because you want to make sure it's within specifications. If it's too thin, it won't have the wear resistance that it needs. And if it's too thick, then that affects the mechanical properties of the, of the bolt and tire. So you want to make sure that this thickness is just in that uh, medium range. And we do that with the photomicrograph that you see here. It's also good for checking for cracks. You can, if you look really closely, you can see sort of micro cracks that are beginning to form in the roots of your th threads here. And that's something else that metallography is really good for. I was also involved in materials testing, which is related to this apparatus that you see here. This is a tensile tester. And essentially, you're going to take the material that you're testing, which is this specimen here in the middle. And once you've got your specimen made, then you're going to slip it into these mounted grips here. The one that you see at the bottom is stationary. It doesn't move at all. But the one on the top you can see is attached to a frame that moves up and down. And so you stick your specimen here in the grips. This device here is called an extensometer. So it, it's going to measure how quickly does the material extend once you start the test. Because when you push that go button, this upper grip is just going to ramp itself right up and going to break the specimen in two pieces. So we want to measure how quickly does the material extend out under the applied force of this upper grip. And this is really cool because once you press the go button, you're like, yeah, you get to break stuff. And I was like, hey, cool. I get paid to break stuff. That's so awesome. But eventually I moved on to other fields of endeavor looking at what's called failure analysis. So essentially failure analysis is looking like CSI type work, but without the blood, the cops, and the gore. So 
you know, we're looking at things that are broken and typically we're given broken pieces and we're told, tell us what happened. Why did this break? And typically there's two types of people that are asking that question. The first are the lawyers. They want to know who to sue in court. And the other part are the, you know, the plant management, the, you know, the, the people that are responsible for equipment in say like a manufacturing facility or wherever the equipment's coming from. They're, they're actually responsible for the equipment and they want to know what happened so they can lower their repair costs by avoiding the failure in the future. Eventually I moved on to become a reliability engineer. This is essentially applying statistics to engineering purposes. And I was working mostly for the power generation industry. So you can see here an example of a gas turbine unit. And this is the, it looks like the compressor section of the turbine. And you can see the heavy cast iron casing. It's so heavy that they have to have a crane to lift it up and off of the unit. And uh, they, they want this heavy cast iron casing on your unit because if one of these blades cracks loose, and that's very possible, and then these blades that are, you know, it's rotating at high speed, these blades fly off and they become very dangerous and deadly weapons. They'll slice through a whole lot of stuff, including people. So in order to keep people safe, you want to keep this cast iron casing on your unit. You get a, you know, kind of a size of the unit here by looking at the size of the guy that's right next to it. This is actually one of the smaller models that are available. You, I mean, they come much, much, much bigger. It's so, uh, you got lots of rotating, moving parts inside and, Trying to figure out when one of these pieces is going to fail is of great importance to people that use these turbines because the turbines are used by power utilities to generate electricity for the grid. Well, what happens if one of these units fails when it's not supposed to? Well, you can't, you can't run it. You can't make your electricity. People like turning the lights on when they flip the switch. They don't like being in a blackout. So, you know, when are these things going to fail? That's what the statistical models were predicting. And they're actually quite accurate. Uh, you know, for every minute that this unit is not running, that it should be running, the power utility loses tens of thousands of dollars every minute. So you can see very quickly, it, it you know, you want to keep this thing running when it's supposed to be running. On the flip side, you don't want to be inspecting too often for failed parts inside because... That means that your unit's not running and producing electricity. So that sweet spot in the middle between the two extremes is what you want. And that's what our statistical models were giving you. The picture that you see here on the far right, this is a transition piece section. Again, you can get kind of a relative idea of the size of the unit by looking at the welder here on the inside. He's actually doing some weld repair here on the inside. And these transition pieces, what they do is they the one end connects to the the individual cans for the combustion section. That's where the actual burning of the natural gas takes place. It's a fuel air mixture that's burned. And the other end attaches to the, actually this back end of the turbine here, where you've got the, what they call buckets. They're actually, they're actually like uh, blades that are incurved in, in such that they capture the air, which is why they're called, and I guess that's why they're called buckets. I never really knew why they were called buckets, but that's what they're called, buckets. And so they capture the air, and that forced air that's coming out turns the rotor of the turbine, which is connected to the rotor and the generator. The generator spins magnets inside a huge uh, copper coil, and that's what in, it creates the electricity that is then pushed out onto the grid. So I did that for a little while, and then... I got tired of the engineering lifestyle. Uh, not that I didn't like my job, but yeah, there was just some, some things about the work environment that I just didn't like, especially as it relates to corporate America. So I made a switch into education. I'm now teaching classes at CWI and Boise State. And uh, I teach whatever I can get my hands on, which has typically been math, statistics, physics, there's a, a first semester experience class at CWI called QUID that I teach. And then also I teach uh, engineering classes as well. So what is it that you should call me? How should you dress me? Well, some of my students like to be bland and proper. They call me Mr. Curtis. 
they call me Professor Curtis, and if that's your cup of tea, then hey, more power to you. But if you'd like to be more bold and daring, you can call me Doc. Now, I got students on either side of the fence here, and, you know, I don't judge. Whichever side of the fence you want to be on here is fine, but these are pretty much your options for how you should address me. So take your pick and run with it. Let's debunk some myths about physics. First myth I want to debunk is that physics is hard. Well, the fact is, physics is like most things in life. It's only as hard as you think it is. You know, the great American industrialist Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. It's all about mindset and how we set ourselves up. So if you start out by thinking this is going to be super hard, guess what? It will be. But if you start out by thinking that, hey, this is something that I can do, I just have to apply myself appropriately, then that's what it will be for you. Next myth I want to debunk is that physics means really complicated math. Well, the fact is, math is the language of science and engineering, and that's especially true of physics. But it doesn't have to be complicated. And in fact, in this course, we will be doing some math, but we're going to keep that math to a very minimum level because we want to focus on the concepts. So there's actually three ways to teach physics. The first way is the calculus-based physics, and this is how I learned physics. And the reason why calculus is used to teach physics is because, well, that's really where a lot of the physics comes from, is from the calculus. And that's the way most scientists and engineers will learn their physics through study of calculus. The second way to teach physics is with an algebra-based approach. So they don't get into the calculus, but they use the algebraic equations that the calculus produces, and then they just focus on those algebraic equations. And then the last way, which is the way we're going to approach it, is called conceptual physics, where you do have some math, but you keep it to a minimum, and you focus more on the concepts. And many of the concepts are actually encased in the math, which is why we have to have some of the math. But we're really going to focus on the concepts in this course more than the math. Third myth I want to debunk is that physics means boredom if you're not a math person. Again, lots of physics and getting co co coded in that math, but you know some people don't really think of themselves as a math person. Well, I would encourage you to break out of that because the fact of the matter is physics means fun for everyone. So you may not be a math person, but that's just how you're thinking about yourself. Remember, Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Well, if you think you're not a math person, then you're going to find math to be very hard for you. But if you think of yourself as someone who can learn how to do math, then math can be very easy for you. It's all in how you think it. And it's called attaining what's called a growth mindset. So when approaching anything new in life, you need to adopt a growth mindset. And on that point, what we're going to do now is watch this excellent video that was made by a 14-year-old teenage girl in Australia. So hopefully this will come up. I'm going to get this. Tell me this is going to work. My button. Hey, here we go. All right. Let's check this out now. What is a growth mindset? We can liken the theory of growth and fixed mindset to the story of the tortoise and the hare. To have a fixed mindset means to believe one's basic abilities, intelligence and talents are just fixed traits. A growth mindset means that you understand that talents and abilities can be developed through effort, practicing and persistence. People with a fixed mindset often develop and peak before their peers, appearing to be more intelligent and successful than everyone else. However, this is a dangerous trap to fall into. The moment we believe that success is determined by an ingrained level of ability, we will be brittle in the face of adversity. This is what happens to the hare. The tortoise, however, with a growth mindset, continues to power through and work hard, overtaking the hare eventually and winning the race. Nice one, Terry. 
Thanks, narrator. You're welcome, Terry. How many of us think ourselves as not maths people, or creative, or sociable, or athletic? If we are to fulfil our potentials, we have to start thinking differently. We are not chained or bound to our current abilities. Take this tree for example. It needs to be fed with lots of minerals and food for it to grow, just like you do. By continuing to nurture and care for this tree, it can grow taller and stronger than other trees. The trunk and branches will literally explode with growth, just like your brain. Your brain is malleable and physically can change size and grow. Even more so at a young age, the activity and growth of the brain during your short teenage years is phenomenal. So how do you do this? Well, there's no shortcut or secret solution. It's as simple as hard work, commitment and perseverance. In any chosen field or career path, you are certain to have some level of failure at one point. But at each pitfall we come across, you must learn to overcome it. There is a popular movie quote that goes like this. Why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up. Batman wasn't born with any superpowers, abilities or talents. And just as Gotham's Dark Knight understood, he had to train relentlessly to succeed. So must you. Right now these fixed mindset learners might be ahead of others, but they are afraid of failure. And when they reach the peak that they're comfortable with, they'll just stay there. They will never reach their full potential. Failure is the almost essential step to success, and as the growth mindset continues to improve, they will overtake the rest. If you feel like you're in a fixed mindset, don't lose hope because there is a lot we can do to change that, but start by listening to our fixed mindset voice, and when you hear it, talk back with a growth mindset voice. If you hear, I can't do it, add, yet. Fixed mindsets can change, so what mindset are you in? All right, so I just want you to keep in mind that it's important to have that growth mindset because we really can accomplish whatever we set our minds to. So now, hello. Here we go. Let's talk for syllabus for a minute. So the syllabus is there on Blackboard, and you really do need to read this document. And I know it's boring as all get out because it's written in all this legalese. And the reason it's written like a legal document is because, well, there are students who just push the boundaries. They push the boundaries of what's acceptable. And so we have to write these things out like they're legal documents because that's how some students, they just abuse the uh, privileges that are given to them. And, and well, that's the result of what happens when you do that. So I know it's a really boring document to read, but you're going to be bound by the, you know, everything that's there written in the syllabus. So you really want to read it. We're only going to look at a few highlights today to establish some expectations. There's some things that I want to make sure you understand because I read it because I know some of you are not going to read this document. Okay, so we're going to go over a few things that you absolutely need to know. And then, uh, you know, I hope that you, you know, go back and read the document because you will be responsible for understanding everything that's there in the syllabus. Because, I mean, those are the policies and the procedures that are going to apply to how the class is going to be administered. So you really do want to read the document, even though it's boring as all get out. First, let's talk about my availability. So I have office hours. They're located in the Nampa Campus Academic Building, room 107, cubicle T. This is if 107 is actually, it's the, the double doors that are right next to the security guard station there in the front lobby of the building. And if you go on those double doors, directly on your right, you'll see the receptionist area. And then directly behind that receptionist area on the wall is a row of offices. 
and then there's a row of cubicles directly in front of that row of offices. And the cubicle that's on the front end of that back row, directly behind the reception area, that's cubicle T. So that's where I usually set for my office hours. I'll be there on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, lab is scheduled to get over at 445, so I've scheduled my office hours from 5 to 6. However, as you'll learn when you come to lab and you're actually going through each of the different labs for uh, each of the different lab sessions, many of the labs are not going to take you three hours to get through. So, you know, when we get if we get done early, then I'll just hold my office hour for the hour following the end of whenever lab gets done. And uh, this way, you know, I don't have to stay around for a whole lot and you don't have to stay around for a whole lot just to try to catch me during an office hour. Uh, so that's the way that's going to work, whichever comes first. That hour after lab gets done is when I'm going to have my office hour. Now, if this doesn't work for you, then you're you know free to schedule an appointment with me, and we'll try to see what we can work out with the schedules to get uh, get you in to see me, and uh, you know for whatever it is that you need to see me for. But for the generally speaking, for the office hours, you don't need an appointment. Just come on, come see me. I also respond to email generally within two business days. So to clarify, business day is a Monday through Friday that's not a holiday. So, you know, if we have, say, you email me on Wednesday, if Thursday or Friday are not holidays, then, yeah, you you should get a response no later than Friday. But if you email me on Friday, well, assuming Monday is not a holiday, then, yeah, you're not going to get you're not going to get a response to me by Sunday. You're going to get at the latest by Tuesday because Saturday and Sunday are not business days. So generally within two business days is when you'll get a response to email. Now, if I'm online when you send me the mail, I'm going to respond mm, yeah, pretty quickly. If I'm not online, then you're just basically going to have to wait until I get online. And, you know, I, you know, this is pretty much going to be Mondays and Wednesdays, and probably once more towards the end of the week. Grading policy. So we're using standard letter grades for the course. Uh, so, you know, 90s or A, 80s or B, 70s or C, so on and so forth. The final grade that you get in the course is going to be weighted. So there's different categories of assignments that you're going to be responsible for, and they're weighted differently. So... 10% of your grade will come from your homework assignments. 30% of your grade will come from the tests that you're going to take during the, the course of the, of the summer. So here we've got three different units. So one exam for each of those three units that together will be averaged together and count for 30% of your grade. Your labs will count for 20% of your grade. And then another 20% comes from the final exam, which is comprehensive. And then the final 20% of your grade will come from the signature assignment. This is sort of like a, a final project, a sort of a capstone assignment, if you will. And the reason why you have to have a signature assignment for the class is because this is fulfilling a general education requirement. So that all the general education classes, they got to have a signature assignment with them. And so 20% of your grade will come from that project. The textbook for the class is Paul Hewitt's uh, Conceptual Physics, it's the 12th edition. This is not required for the class. It's actually only recommended. The reason why I don't require it is because I'm trying to save you some money. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, even if you buy this book used, you, you, I mean, you're going to be, you know, a small little wad of cash there. So... Yeah, why not save the cash? Everything that you need uh, to successfully complete your assignments and take your tests is in the lectures. So, you know, all that information is there in the lectures. Why do you need to buy a textbook? Well, you don't absolutely need to buy a textbook. Now, some students do buy a textbook because having that extra resource that they can use and lean on just makes them feel more comfortable. The other thing that's good about the textbook is that the guy that wrote your textbook is a physicist. I'm not a physicist. I'm an engineer. Okay, Physicists and engineers look at the world a little differently. 
physicists are about, you know, science and understanding like this is the way the world works and we want to understand the way the world works. So we can step back and look at it and say, wow, what a beautiful thing. Isn't that just like, it's like, a, it's like art. You know, we just look and say, wow, it's so beautiful. And there is something beautiful to the way the universe works. But as an engineer, I step back and I ask, okay, that's great. Now what am I supposed to do with it? How can I use this? And that's the difference between a scientist and an engineer. The engineers are interested in application. How can we use this to solve problems? How can we use this to make people's lives better? You know, where the scientist, the pure scientist, is satisfied with understanding why things work in and of itself with no real thought of the application. Now, many scientists like to fancy themselves as engineers because they get into the, the, the uh, you know, the application aspects of things. But technically speaking, the pure scientists, yeah, are not going to have it. So, you know, they have a different perspective on things than we engineers do. And so some students like to have that alternative explanation from that different perspective of the stuff that we're going to go through in the course. And so if that describes you, feel free to go get your textbook. You can get it from the bookstore. You can buy it online. You know, you can buy it new or used. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I'm not requiring the textbook for the class, but it is recommended, especially if you feel like you need that extra resource to get you through the course. Now, one thing you do need to understand is that if you buy a textbook, make sure you do not buy an access code for Mastering Physics. Mastering Physics is a software program that is put online by Pearson and it basically contains all the like homework assignments for the class. Mastering Physics is designed to you know provide students with that online resource so they can access their homework assignments anywhere and they can work on it and it gives it ease for the instructor so they say because you know the software is grading everything for the instructor so it's convenient for everybody at least that's how they sell it my experience and that of my students using mastering physics is that this software sucks royally i mean you pay 300 bucks for something that is just so lap lappy and it's clunky and it, it doesn't always work right um, as instructor i found that you know, it supposedly gave me the flexibility to take out questions and put my own in. Well, I found in my experience that Mastering Physics would leave in the questions I wanted taken out, and they would not put in the questions I put in. So, I don't know what was going on with this, and every time I called the help desk, oh my gosh, and so it's so oxymoronic, because the help desk was anything but helpful. Okay. Hello, my name is Dami Bando Badai. How can I help you today? You know, I mean, it was that kind of thing. I was like, the, you, you, know, you understand, they're just reading scripts off their screen. Okay. That's all they were doing. It didn't under even understand what this program was supposed to be doing or how it worked. And so I just got frustrated with the whole thing. I said, my students are frustrated with this. I'm frustrated with this. Why are they spending 300 bucks a pop for this? This is nuts. So I developed my own materials to be put into Blackboard. It doesn't cost you anything extra. So yes, I saved you $300 by not requiring you to purchase an access code to Mastering Physics, and you're welcome. <laughs> so hopefully you haven't bought an access code, and if you have, I hope you can get your money back because you do not need Mastering Physics for this course. So do not purchase an access code. All your homework assignments are in Blackboard. Now, the other thing you're going to need for the class is a hand calculator. Now, with most people nowadays, they, you know, if they need a calculator, they reach for some app that's in their phone. Well, you're not going to be able to use your phone during a test. So you need to get used to using a separate hand calculator for the calculations that you're going to need to do on your test. It doesn't need to be anything fancy. I mean, just a simple... $10 model will suffice, and there's plenty of them out there, and you can find them online, you can get them on Amazon, you can, I mean, if you want to go to a brick and mortar store, Target, Walmart, Best Buy, they all have these calculators, okay? You don't need anything fancy, just a simple, basic calculator will, will suffice for most of your needs, okay? 
you can't use the cap calculator app, whatever it is that you have in your phone, okay? Because you can't use your phone during the test. If you try using your phone during the test, then I'm going to think you're cheating. I take your test and give you a zero, and that's the end of that. Uh, so you don't want to be using the calculator app in your phone. Get used to using something else so that when you come to that test day, you're already comfortable with doing calculations on that hand calculator. Make sure, though, that, you know, if you I mean, use whatever model calculator you want, but I have to restrict the graphing calculators because these have the capability to store notes. And notes and books and all that kind of stuff are prohibited during the tests. So, of course, I can't let you use a graphing calculator because that's going to, you know, you have the ability to store notes in the calculator. So, uh, you know, just, again, just a simple model is all you really need. Chill out a few bucks and buy you something decent, and, you know, that'll get you through. Let's talk a little bit about the course. I'm delivering this course in a flipped format. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to flip a class? Well, traditional face-to-face -face classes have lectures that are delivered during class, and that's how I've been teaching this class up to this, up to this term. But this term I decided to do something different. I decided to flip the class, which means I'm putting all of my lectures on video. You can watch them anytime you want. Students love this stuff. Uh, I flipped my statistics class a couple years ago. The students really love that. They can watch the video on their schedule. They can take notes at their pace. They can stop and rewind and do all that stuff with the video. They can take notes at their pace. They can watch it again and again however many times they want. And they just love that stuff. And I just thought for a summer physics class that that's what I should be doing for my students in that course. So I'm going to be flipping the class this term. The videos are not designed for you to just sit and watch. They're designed to facilitate active learning. So what does it mean to engage active learning? Well, the opposite of active learning is passive learning. And that's just you're just sitting there and watching the video. You're not actually doing anything. You're just letting it wash over you and hoping that you're going to get it through osmosis. Well, that doesn't really work for most people. You're not going to learn a whole lot if you approach it in that way. But if you approach it with an active learning intention, that means you're going to want to engage with the content. And so I have actually designed these videos to contain different activities that will help you to learn the content that's there in the video. So don't just sit there and passively watch, okay? If I asked you a question and then I pause, I'm waiting for you to answer. Go ahead and make that answer and make it out loud. Because when you answer out loud, it encodes something in your brain. And then, of course, I give you that immediate feedback there in the video with the proper answer so you can fix that in your brain and actually have it stick a little bit more. Actually doing something with the content, applying it, working with it, that sort of thing. I have activities that are going to be in the videos that are designed to help you with that sort of thing. And so, you know, when you reach that point in the video, go ahead and pause the video, work through the activity, answer the questions in the little mini quiz that I'm going to give you. Or, you know, if there's an activity where I want you to calculate something, then stop the video and run the calculation. You know, whatever it is, okay, there's resources there. Now, in addition to the videos, because most of what you can see here is just, it's just PowerPoint presentation for the most part, and so the slides from the presentations I use in the video are also available there on Blackboard. However, I have omitted certain portions of the slides. There are blanks that are there for you to fill in. So the idea is that you print these slides off and use it as a workbook. So when I talk about your workbook, that's what I'm talking about. Print off the slides, and while you're watching the video, fill in the blank portions. Take notes. There's plenty of white space, as you can see, with the format I got here for you to take notes. So go ahead, take those notes. And then, you know, now you've got something that you're engaging the content with. And you've got something there that you can keep to help you study for your upcoming tests. So I'm trying to provide you with resources that can help you to learn, um, not just in the classroom, but basically outside the classroom. In fact, most of your learning is going to be outside of the classroom because all the lectures are on video. The, the
the con the activities and all that content is encoded with the lecture that's going to be on video and you're going to be watching that outside of class so yeah most of your learning for this course is going to occur outside the classroom well that kind of begs the question maybe you're like jackie chan looking at all this and saying what in the world if all the lectures are on video then what are we going to be doing in class well i have a simple answer for that class time is for answering questions so you're going to be expected to watch the videos outside of class and you're going to be expected to take notes and get all of your questions answered with the video now i understand that you know that you can't have a one-size-fits-all thing that explains it clearly for everybody because we all learn a little bit different so if there's something the video didn't quite get for you if there's something that you didn't quite make sense of or if it left you with a question maybe you're working on a homework assignment and yeah the video was okay but you still got a question about something that's on the homework assignment it's not quite getting you there well then take those questions and bring them to class class time is for answering those questions about the knowledge gaps that you find as you're doing your work outside of class so feel free to you know ask questions that's what the class time is for and we've got plenty of time in class for answering questions so you know if there's something on the lecture videos or you know all the homework assignments i've put feedback into them if they don't answer your questions uh, then go ahead and bring those questions to class make sure on the homework assignments that you understand why the right answer is the right answer if you don't understand that then you won't be able to answer the questions on the test correctly because i'm going to ask about the same sort of things but i'll ask the question in a different way so if all you're doing is memorizing answers you're not likely to get as far on your test as you would if you actually understood why the right answer is the right answer and if you don't understand that hey that's a question bring the class maybe there's something there in the lecture video it's like you know this kind of, you kind of explained it all right but i'm kind of missing this part i didn't i understand what you said about this bring those kind of questions to class okay that's what class time is for answering questions of course if you don't have any questions then hey i'm not going to make you come to class there's no need for you to come to class now you may want to come to class anyway just because some other student may ask a question that you didn't know you had so another student asks a question and you're hearing the student ask that question and you think oh wow yeah you know what i didn't realize i had that question that's a good question i don't know the answer to that i want to hear the answer to that well you're not going to know that if you don't come to class so i mean you can come to class, but if you want Okay, I'm not going to force you to come to class. There's no attendance part of your grade, right? There's no requirement that you have to come to class. So, you know, you don't have to come to class if you don't have any questions. And this does two things. One, for the students who don't have any questions, I mean, it's kind of a burden for you to actually have to come to class. So, it helps them out. And second, it helps me out because then that gives me more ability to focus on the students who do have questions. So it's a win-win situation for everybody. Classes will start at 11 o'clock. It's scheduled to end at 1.45, I know, but it's going to end at 1 or whenever we run out of questions, whichever happens first. I'm a big believer in not making people be in a certain place when we don't need to be there. We don't even want to be there. So, you know, let's go in, let's get the work done we need to get done, and then we can go and do whatever else we want to do. Okay. Now, I don't anticipate that the students in the class are going to, you know, basically be there for more than, say, like a half hour. Uh, I, I don't anticipate that. It may be, but I don't. Now, in the event that, you know, you do have a lot of questions and you come in, and you're asking all these questions and it's taking us a while to get all those questions answered well then that's fine but the class is going to end at one o'clock keep in mind again i said that the scheduled time for the class in is at 1 45 but that schedule was made before i flipped the class and it was made without consulting with me so in order to accommodate you know a better 
uh, lunch break between the lecture and the lab because lab starts at 2. So we're going to start class at 11. We'll go through all your questions. And if you get done with all those questions before 1 o'clock, then, hey, then that's, you know, that's great. We're done. I'll see you in lab at 2. If, however, you keep asking questions and questions and questions, then I'll answer whatever questions we get. And then 1 o'clock hits. And then, okay, boom, we're done. We're out of here. Because we need more of a break there between the lecture and the lab. This is a problem they said they were going to fix. And they haven't fixed it yet. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm flipping my class anyway. So, you know, you're not losing anything out by us quitting at 1. Because, again, everything you need is there on video. And that's debatable for you to watch, you know, whenever you want. So, whenever we get done with the questions or 1 o'clock, whichever comes first, that's when class is going to end. Again, I said attendance is not mandatory. However, there are some important exceptions to that statement that you need to know about. The first one is the first week of class. The school likes to take attendance for the first week of class for financial aid purposes. So... Uh, the register office is interested in it as well. Uh, and there's other people in the administration that like to know about that sort of thing. So uh, you have to attend class during the first week. If you miss either class or both classes during the first week of class, you will be automatically dropped from the course. It doesn't matter what the, what the reason is. You're, you're gone. Okay. So make sure you're in class at 11 a.m. on Monday and Wednesday that first week. Other days when you need to be in attendance are during test days. So when you go in and take your tests, okay, and remember there's three of them, and then there's the final exam. So in essence, there are six days during the course of the summer that you have to be in class. Other than those six days, come, not come, you know, it, it, you know, either way you want to work that. But those six days, the first week of class and then the four days that we're having a test, you have to be in class. Let's take a look at the course schedule. And this is why we have what we have as far as the course structure is going. So you can see that, you know, okay, it's a survey class. We're not going to get too deep in any one topic because there's a lot of stuff we got to cover that are crammed into eight weeks that you see here. That said, notice that not every chapter in the book is included in the schedule. So if I come over here and say I'm going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then whoop, we skip over to chapter 11. So there's some chapters here that are actually missing in the schedule that we're not actually going to be looking at because we got so much to fit in such a short amount of time that you know, some, I mean, some decisions have to be made of what we keep and what we don't keep. On that same note, just because we have a chapter that appears in the schedule doesn't mean we'll cover everything in that chapter. So if we look here at, say, chapter 15, Temperature, Heat, and Expansion, uh, there's a concept in that chapter about uh, the coefficient of thermal expansion, which is kind of a basic idea when you're talking about temperature and how it affects materials. And, but we don't cover it in the course. Okay? Again, there's so much that we have to go through in just eight weeks that we got to make decisions about what to keep and what not to keep. So, you know, just because the chapter is there on the schedule doesn't mean we're going to go through everything in the chapter. Now, every chapter that you see listed on the schedule has a homework assignment. And that homework assignment is typically due by, you know, a minute to midnight of the following Saturday. Okay, so we can see here the first week we're going to go over chapters 1 through 4. So we've got homework assignments for chapter 1 through 4 due on that following Saturday. Go down to the next week, though. We've got 5, 6, 7, then we skip over to 11, 12, 13. But only the homework assignments for chapters 5 through 7 are due that following Saturday. 11 through 13 will be due the following Saturday. The reason for that is because there's a test that following Monday on the 17th, and so... That test, look, only covers section chapters 1 through 7. So these chapters are not covered on this exam. And so to help you focus more on this exam, I'm only requiring the homework for the chapters that are going to be covered on that exam to be due before the exam starts. So generally speaking, yes, do the following Saturday, but sometimes you can see there are exceptions I'm making to give you more space to study for those exams. Because, again... 20% of your grade is coming from those tests. 
there's no makeup work for anything that you that you're gonna miss. So if you miss a homework assignment, and because uh, you were out partying or whatnot on Saturday, you didn't get it done during the week. You know, I'm sorry, you lost it. Okay, this this right here is your notice that you're again expected to be responsible for your education. So you're responsible for assembling the different things in your life so that you know you can get things done on time on schedule and if you miss that then well oh, I'm sorry I guess you missed that okay you you've got notice here up front that this is this is what you're expected to do and so now it's just a matter of following through with that so if you miss a due date on anything yeah don't even bother just just say look I'm just gonna chalk it up make the best that I can as I move on Smoking, of course, is not prohibited inside CWI buildings. Food and drink, uh, many classes do not allow them. I allow them in my class as long as you don't make a mess or distract others. Keep in mind that's just the lecture section of the class. As we'll learn when you come to lab, food and drink is absolutely prohibited in the lab. So you can't bring that to lab. But if you want to bring it to the lecture section of the class, feel free. All I ask is that you don't make a mess and you don't distract other people, okay? Be respectful. That's all I ask. Uh, same thing with the phones, okay? You, you're welcome to do your phones. I mean, you want to sit there and text on your phone. You know, I mean, that's, hey, you're paying for the class, man. That, hey, hey, you're free to do that, man, if that's how you want to use the money that you've spent for the time and the opportunity or whatnot. But, hey, you know, if you do, you know, if your phone rings or whatnot or you need to make a call, whatever, just take it outside. Let's just be respectful, okay? That's all I ask. Just be respectful of other people. And as long as everyone's respectful of everyone else, we'll all get along. Again, you're responsible for your education, your success in this class, and indeed your success in any class is not the responsibility of the instructor. You're not paying tuition and fees so that you can succeed in a class and check it off a list so you can get a diploma. That's not what your tuition and fees is paying for. Your tuition and fees is paying for an opportunity to succeed. And what you do with that opportunity is your choice and your responsibility and your responsibility alone. So, you know, that's especially important for a class like physics because every time we go into new concepts, we're usually building on concepts we've learned already. So the class will build on itself as we go through the eight weeks of the summer course. That means you need to kind of stay on track with things. And that means you need to do the work that's required for you to stay on schedule. So, you know, all that work that you're going to need to do outside the classroom, watching the lecture videos, participating in those activities that I have uh, encoded in the videos, and completing your homework assignments, and, you know, finding out where your knowledge gaps are so you can bring those questions to class. That's your responsibility, not mine, yours. So you need to do the work that needs to be done for you to succeed. That's your responsibility. And if that's something that's not going to be convenient with other things you've got going on in your life, then you probably want to drop the class. Because if you go on with the class, you're going to be expected, hey, You've got work to do. You've got a responsibility. You've got deadlines. You've got to, you've got to belly up to the bar. You've got to meet the requirement. It's, it's just the way it's going to be. So before we wrap up with this introductory lecture video, I want to give you an example of, you know, one type of activity that you might find in a lecture video. So let, let's see how much you learned about the syllabus concepts we've talked about so far. So when I get to the next slide, uh, it's good, you're going to see six questions that are there, and I want you to pause the video and take a moment to answer those six questions that you find there, okay? It's not going to be part of your grade, but I want to give you a taste of what's to come. So, you know, go ahead, run through the activity, and then when you do get done with the questions, go ahead and resume the video, and we'll go over the correct answers together. Okay, here we go. Here's your syllabus questions, so go ahead. Pause the video here, and then when you get ready, go ahead and start the video over again, and we'll look at the right answers to these questions. 
Okay, I hope you uh, were able to get through all these questions okay. Let's go ahead and review the answers to each one of these questions in turn. So the first question, if you email your instructor on Wednesday, July 3rd, when is the latest date that you can expect a reply? Well, I hope you said, you know, you remember that the policy on the email was you'll get a response from me within two business days. So two business days from Wednesday, July 3rd is Monday, July 8th. Okay, this is two days because two business days, mind you, because Thursday, July 4th is a holiday. That's not a business day. So Friday, July 5th is going to be business day number one. Saturday's not a business day. Sunday's not a business day. The second business day is then Monday, July 8th. So that's the latest that you can expect to get a reply if you email me on Wednesday, July 3rd. Next question. The signature assignment counts for what percentage of your final grade? Remember the signature assignment, that final project you have to complete for the course? That's going to be 20% of your final grade. So, yeah, you're not going to want to skip out on the signature assignment. And again, we'll give you more information about the signature assignment later on as we get further into the course. Third question. Do you need an access code for this class? Well, I hope you answered no to that question. Do not purchase an access code for the class. Your assignments will be on Blackboard at no extra cost to you. Question number four. When a given chapter is covered in class, when will the homework for that chapter be due? And as we saw when we looked at the schedule, generally that's going to be a minute to midnight on the following Saturday. That's a general rule. Now, sometimes it may be the week after. Again, follow that schedule. That's going to be pretty much fixed as we go through the course this summer. Question five, what is the makeup policy? Well, I hope you responded that there is no makeup policy. There's just no time for it. I mean, if you go back and look at the schedule, you'll see we're cramming a lot of stuff into eight weeks and so in order to accommodate all of this stuff that we got to cover in such a short amount of time we really got to be booking we really got to be moving we don't have time to play catch up so you've got to stay on course you've got to stay on track if you want to do well in the course and the last question true or false cell phone use is permitted in class and this statement is true Provided you don't disturb other people. Be respectful. So if you have to make or, or take a call, then please step outside. Let's not be disruptive to other people. Let's be respectful. And that pretty much brings us to the end here. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.